I first visited Iran extensively in 2007 uh, to make part of a film there and um, I just fell in love with the Iranian people and what really hurt me was this notion that we in the UK and I'm sure people in the United States kind of regarded the Iranians as 70 million fanatics um, and I had spent wonderful time with people in, the, in this country with its ancient culture, with its traditions, its beautiful architecture. And when I saw the 2009 demonstrations, I thought, this is going to change. When people see the Iranians as they really are. The other thing I wanted to do with this film was, I wanted to do three film things with this film. The second thing, I wanted to commemorate Neda. And the third thing is that I wanted the people who demonstrated whatever happened not to think that their courage has been forgotten. Wow. There were a lot of risks and fears, uh, I understand, from our previous conversation in making this documentary. Tell us about some of those risks. What was your biggest concern in making this? And how you got this unprecedented access to Neda's family and close friends. That's right. Um, Sheila Evans of HBO, who commissioned the film, she had a sort of insight, which was quite extraordinary, into who Neda really was. And she wanted a film which would move her away from being just a symbol to being a human being that we could identify with and know. And the big challenge came from her was, can you get access to the family? Is that possible? And she gave me about two months to work that out. Now, the family, the mother had appeared um, photographs of, sh of Neda. She'd posted on the web. I believe she gave uh, written interviews, including to CNN. But we were asking to go much further, to go into the family home and to learn about Neda personally. That's one question. The second question is, even if they agreed, who would have the courage to do this? So um, I contacted all my Iranian friends in the media and journalism. And finally, I was given recommendation to a young man called Saeed Kamali Dehigan, who unfortunately can't be with us here today. And uh, he, I was told that he had a courage that bordered on madness. And at that point, he was a freelance journalist. That's right. So he had contacts. That's right. He was a freelance journalist. He was also the first journalist in, uh, in Iran to discover Neda's family name and where she lived. Um, the apartment where the family lived. Anyhow, he came to London to see me in September. We talked it through, and he immediately agreed. And then uh, we made further contact with the family. I gave him an, an intense course in filmmaking for two days. He'd never touched a camera before. And in he went, and we waited. And finally, we got news that the family agreed to meet him. And then a week later, the family agreed to the filming. And what was wonderful about him was he formed such a close and trusting relationship with the family. And what he's given is the center of this film, the heart of this film, where you see Neda's banned books, you see her private diaries, you see the clothes she was wearing, even family videos of her dancing. And, and suddenly this woman who is this symbol, this powerful symbol, is a human being that we recognize. But wasn't that scary for him, knowing perhaps Neda's home, Neda's family was being watched to a couple of times a week to have contact with them, go inside their home, talk to them on camera? It was very, very frightening. And uh, the five weeks that he was in Iran were, I think, the worst five weeks of my life. I mean, I've made films in dangerous places and war situations. I've climbed Everest. Um, and I'm sharing the risks with the people that are making the film. Here I was sitting on my butt in London while a 24-year-old was going in and taking all these risks on my behalf. And we had a system where he would email me every night that he could to say that he was safe, but some nights there was a power outage, some, and I didn't hear from him, and those were terrible nights. But he, he did it. I mean, the sad thing was uh, there was no alternative because I couldn't go into Iran. All foreign journalists are forbidden at the moment. And if somebody looking like me walked into the family apartment, wow, this would be, you know, the word would get around in no time. So I had to substitute somebody else. And I think his achievement is absolutely phenomenal. And I have to ask you how in the world you got those tapes out of the country. 
Well, we, we really, uh, I know we thought and thought about this. We investigated courier services working out of Iran and which ones we could trust. And uh, anyhow, we made copies of everything and a trusted person in Tehran kept all the copies. And then Saeed thought, to hell with all this. And he bought a whole lot of other DVDs, sort of pop DVDs, put all our DVDs inside the sleeves and came out with all this evidence in his suitcase. And I must tell you a story because um, his flight was due to leave London. I they leave Tehran about 7 in the morning, get to London about 12. And I kept seeing it was delayed and delayed and delayed. And I just read an article, funny enough, only two weeks earlier about when these delays happen, it often means that the security people have discovered somebody on the list mm -hmm. who they want to interrogate. And I just... And I'll never forget the Huge moment. Huge sigh of relief oh, when, when he walked into right. Heathrow and I saw him come through. I've never, never enjoyed meeting somebody as much as I did.